Guillermo del Toro's Cabinet of Curiosity took the world by storm when it was released. Even though the series is only eight episodes, we just couldn't get over how interesting and complex each one was. Plus, every episode brought a new horror to scare our pants off. In today's video, we'll be talking about the biggest problem the series faced in adapting H.P. Lovecraft's work and what we can expect from season two. First off, the series adapted two Lovecraft stories. The adaptations were cool, but both of them were glaring examples of why the famed writer's stories don't translate well on screen. His sense of cosmic terror and monsters like Cthulhu has made him one of the most well-known authors of horror fiction. Although he wasn't a good person in real life because he was bigoted and anti-Semitic and probably a misogynist, no one can deny how powerful his writing was. His stories were dark and terrifying and he put humans at the bottom of the cosmic food chain. Don't worry though, most of them deserved it. Two of his short stories, Pickman's Model and The Dreams in the Witch House, were turned into episodes of the Netflix show. While both of them were exceptional, you could tell something was missing. The monsters just weren't scary enough, and it took away from the entire experience. The stories and their narratives were different. Well, of course, in 2022, we don't support harmful stereotypes and bigotry. The thought process behind the changes was to make them more relevant to a wider audience, but they lost a lot of their original creepiness as a result. To better understand the problem, let's take a closer look at the episodes. Now, a look into Pickman's model. The fifth episode in the series was a complex gothic tale with a super disturbing ending. It was based on a 1926 Lovecraftian short story of the same name. In the episode, William Thurber was a bright young artist whose life began to collapse once he got closer to a mysterious classmate named Pickman. The mystery man would paint the most horrific things and they would then haunt our hero. His unique style raised Thurber's interest and the pair developed a closer friendship. In one pivotal scene, the grotesque painter talked about his dark family's history and exhibited some unsettling artwork typical of Lovecraft. These creatures started showing up in his dreams, so he stopped meeting the painter. They crossed paths once again, but by then our hero had a family and was well settled. After another unsettling confrontation, the family man destroys his friend's collection and shoots him. The man dies right in front of us and we realize that he was the only thing standing between the creepiest monsters and our poor hero. Fans of Lovecraft's work would enjoy seeing the horrible monsters that he created and the ones in the episode were just perfect. The episode challenges its viewers to consider the terrifying possibility that the darkest creations are not the work of someone's imagination, but a warning based on their experience. Even though it had a mysterious, shocking, and sad ending, it does a good job of exploring the nature and power of horror from many angles. Coming up, we've got The Dreams in the Witch House. Episode 6 portrays the saddening story of a bereft man who lost his twin sister while they were still in their teens. Determined to find her lost soul once again, he dedicates his entire life to the exploration of the supernatural. First off, the main character in the episode was Rupert Grant, our very own Ron Weasley. If that isn't enough to glue you to your screens, we don't know what is. The episode depicts one of Lovecraft's most mysterious inventions. It's called the Forest of Lost Souls. It's like limbo for the people who've passed on but have unfinished business in this world. On the downside, you can see how heavily the horror writer relied on cliches and stereotypes. The only way Walter could be united with his twin was through the use of black magic, which, surprise surprise, he got from a tribe of Native Americans. But that's not all. There's another entity trapped between this world and the next who wants to be whole again. Complete with sorcerers, witches, and visions of the future, this episode is the perfect example of the famed writer's work. But again, the witch isn't as menacing as she was in the story, and the legendary forest just didn't cut it. We can't be too disappointed though, we loved seeing our favorite Weasley brother branching out. Finally, the episodes weren't as scary as the stories. Both of these episodes were super engaging and cast season actors, but neither of them were truly scary. They clearly show the problem that almost all Lovecraft movies and TV shows have. Think about it this way. In a short story, you can't focus on every aspect of a character because you don't have enough information. Adapting that to television has the same problem. A 40-minute episode doesn't do justice to any character development simply because there isn't enough time. It makes you want to take a step back from Netflix and pick up a book, doesn't it? It. For these adaptations to work, they need to have something more added into the mix without changing the story. Many people have tried and failed to adapt these short stories as they can't capture the pervasive fear in Lovecraft's works. It all comes down to the age-old debate of book versus TV in the end. Lovecraft's writing is interesting on paper, but it's hard to put them on the big screen for the same reasons. These adaptations don't make you feel like you're experiencing a genuine nightmare, but that doesn't mean we don't love them. They have their unique charm, and we got a binge-worthy show out of it. Now, let's look at the creator's wish list for season two. For the second season, he has some specific dream directors in mind. The eight-part Netflix series is an anthology he curated after winning an Academy Award. The stories in each of these episodes have a scary atmosphere that's both gothic and realistic. In the first season, there were episodes directed by Anna Lily Amer, or Catherine Hardwick and Jennifer Kent. These are the brilliant minds
lines that brought us The Babadook and A Girl Walks Home Alone at night. If that isn't enough to wow the viewers, well-known actors such as Andrew Lincoln, Rupert Grant, and Dan Stevens were cast to play the complex characters. Understandably, the longtime director has an extensive wish list in mind. What's more, here's what he had to say. In an exclusive interview, the creator of the series talked about his plans for a second volume. While it hasn't been picked up for a second season, he's already envisioned the next line of directors that he wants. Among them is the famous True Detective director Issa Lopez. Are you already getting goosebumps? Because we are. This time around, he wants to bring her into the mix. She's a director from Mexico who stands out due to her amazing work on True Detective. Another seasoned director, Larry Fassenden, is at the very top of Del Toro's list. Fun fact, the two were rumored to make another part for the creepy French horror movie The Orphanage but unfortunately things didn't work out as we hoped they would. The creator is a master storyteller at heart and stated that he didn't want to give everything away. He wanted to leave some mystery for the viewers. Can our hearts take it though? We'll just have to wait and see. Fans do know that he has been coming up with new story ideas and finding filmmakers that would be perfect to tell those stories. Everyone loved the series because it reminds us of an evening of telling ghost stories around the campfire. These stories were then brought to life by skilled actors and a very creative stage design. It's full of weird and scary things that hit a little too close to home. Even though every episode wasn't a guaranteed horror fest, some of them could blow your socks off. Lastly, when will we get to see the second season? As the series came out during the peak of the scary season, no one could tell how well it did at first. Viewers were surprised that each episode brought with it new horrors. About 70% of Netflix viewers binged the entire thing the night it was released. That's how great it was. According to Insider Reports, the anthology ranked third on its streaming charts with more than 50 hours watched in its first six days. Since the viewing platform doesn't like to share real numbers and statistics, statistics, it's hard to know what would be considered a success. Even if the number of viewers is lower than expected, the platform may find other reasons to keep working with a director like him who wouldn't. Aside from the main theme of horror, there isn't much connection between the different episodes of Cabinet of Curiosities. When the project was first released, it got a lot of praise and a lot of attention because of that. We think that's more than enough to warrant a sequel. Actually, we must get one. From the creator's numerous interviews, we know that he's passionate about what he does and we can't wait to see what he has in store for us. Del Toro isn't done with the Cabinet of Curiosities, and neither are we. That's a wrap for this video. Do you want to know more about the second season of Guillermo del Toro's Cabinet of Curiosities? Let us know in the comments below. Make sure to give this video a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel for more videos like this, and we'll see you in the next one.